I'm Erica Lynn, and we all know the ocean is the most demanding environment on Earth, consistently testing the reliability and durability of our equipment. When you spend as much time fishing as I do, you know that reliable gear is essential for staying on the water. This is why I went with Abyss Battery to power my trolling motor, electronics, and outboard. The guys at Abyss Battery are rattling the saltwater industry by manufacturing performance marine batteries specifically designed for sonar, outboards, trolling motors, and electronic fishing reels. They're also Bluetooth compatible, so I found check and battery statuses right on your phone while you're out on the water is a huge game changer. To learn more about why Abyss batteries are used by the pros and factory installed by Premier Boat Builders, visit abyssbattery.com. Fishing like a local isn't just about catching fish. It's about connecting with the environment and the people who call it home. It's about hearing the stories and traditions that have been passed down for generations and sharing unforgettable moments with the people you meet along the way. Fishing like a local is having an experience that stays with you forever. And with Fishing Booker, you can experience it too, no matter where you are. Discover your next adventure on Fishing Booker. Hello and welcome to the Publicly Challenged Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Oswald, and I hope you join me on my quest for knowledge to become a better public land hunter, angler, and forager. Stick with this and who knows, maybe we will learn something together. All right, so I'm sitting here and I am talking to Poldy Wheeland. And, yes, uh, sir. and Poldy, uh, could you go ahead and introduce yourself for everybody listening? Absolutely. So my name is Poldy Wheeland. Um, I live currently in Montana in Bozeman, living the outdoor life out here, really enjoying it. I've been here for a year and a half now, but, uh, originally from Germany, then, uh, moved to Wisconsin around middle school moved back to Germany and eventually decided I need to come back to the U.S. and uh, really start getting into backcountry hunting, foraging, just really enjoy the wild places that the U.S. has to offer. And that was actually one of the, literally one of the main reasons why I came back to the U.S. from Germany um, after, stay, after staying there for quite some time after high school. Uh, all that you know, that possibility for public land and the opportunities in terms of hunting, fishing, and foraging we can do here in the U.S. just screams freedom to me, and that's what I what I seek. So, yeah, happy to be back in the U.S. and just living, living the wild food life out here, I guess. Absolutely. I, uh, I, I love that. I love the fact that you, you realized it screams freedom, and I wish other people would, and they'd want to protect it as much as they can as well. I think that's a very important avenue that we need to approach these days to try and get as many hunters on board as possible and just outdoorsmen in general and uh, have people realize how, how beautiful and wonderful these resources are and how, how it's been set up for us. And they really are. Like me being from Germany, there's, you know, I'm, I didn't grow up with public land. There's no public land in Germany. It's all private or state owned and the state owned isn't public. Um, you do have like hiking trails that go through private woods and whatnot that everyone can use, but it's not something where you can just go out and, and hunt and fish on. There's some gray areas with foraging where the land over, owner doesn't know really, you know, no one's really going to do anything, but you just don't have these beautiful giant pieces of land that are just protected under law or by law that literally every citizen can access and use and utilize in, in many ways. So um, it's it's really is a beautiful thing, like you said, and I think it just offers the opportunity for us, especially those of us that are, you know, so used to living in the city and never get to see the outdoors to go out there and participate almost in a a life that's similar to what our ancestors did. And that's something that drives me a lot. But the one thing is like you just said, like it's people take it for granted here. I've noticed that especially like people have lived here their entire life. Um, you know, when, when something, when you have something forever like that, or it's just so normal, it, it often becomes something that you, you know, don't value as much anymore. But the big thing is that 
yeah, these public lands are beautiful, right? But they're only beautiful until they aren't. So we need to make sure that we take care of them and protect them. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, uh, I, I think that was beautifully put. And I, it makes me wonder, though, you're living in Bozeman now. Have you, uh, have you taken the scenery for granted yet? Is there any mornings no. where you zone out and you don't, you don't realize what's around you anymore? Yeah, I have. <laughs> it, it, it just, like you said, like, it just happens. Um, but there's always these moments where I'm just driving home from work or I'm just driving on a, on a road late in the evening and you see the sunset come in over the mountains and it's just, it hits you with awe and you're just like, wow, like I'm happy I've made it here to this place now and I can enjoy all of this. And I wish more people could, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So before Germany, spent some time in Oconawak, Wisconsin, yes, uh, home of the OKS Hunter podcast. Yeah, and, which uh, I had no idea yeah, about. we were talking was... about that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but so when when you were first over here and the time in high school and stuff that you spent, or after high school, I think you said, uh, was there any hunting involved then? So I basically, No. During that time, no. So I was here middle school till high school, and then I moved back to Germany for three years. Before that, everything before middle school was all growing up there. Uh, there was not really any hunting. There was just some fishing. I initially got into hunting and fishing in Germany when I was a kid. My dad has been a lifelong hunter. I think he's got 40 years of having his German hunting license now. Um, and that's how we bonded. Like he took me out hunting it was all kind of focused on the nature connection more so than the food because today it's all about the food for me really. Um, and I couldn't hunt myself because in Germany you need to be 18 to hunt and you have to take a pretty extensive hunting course and we can get into that if you'd like. Um, so it was just kind of bonding time with dad. And then mom was knew about a few like foraged goodies, like, you know, a couple mushrooms, the German ramps, the German uh, wild onions or leeks. And we'd sometimes go out to try and get those and use them in the kitchen a little bit. But yeah, again, it was just more so the experience was the focus. And then when I did move to the U.S. with my mom, my stepdad, my little brother, um, let my dad stay in Germany. Um, I kind of lost interest in, in all that. I, my dad was a driving factor for it and I didn't have him there. So I just didn't really get into hunting. I don't know why. I always like I did my I got there. I did my hunter's. Uh, safety course when I was like 13 but then I never went out I think it was just my stepdad my mom didn't know anything about guns and I was still pretty young and I for some reason it just fell to the wayside I, like I said I was fishing a little bit but the hunting and fishing really came when I moved back to Germany after high school that's when that really took off for me so over in Germany what what is that like then as far as being able to hunt and, and opportunities to hunt what is yeah, that like it's way different than here in the U.S. Here in the U.S., I mean, I think Wisconsin doesn't even have an age limit now to go hunting. Uh, anyone, I'm pretty sure, can can go out with a and take the hunter safety. In Germany, you have to be um, ideally 18. You can be 16 to get your hunting license, but then until you're 18, you can only hunt with a mentor. If you get your hunting license at 18, you're elig eligible to go out hunt by yourself. Now, barriers of entry are pretty high. Um, there's only about, I think, 350,000 hunters in Germany, 85 million people. My numbers might be a little off, but so there's a very little amount of people that do it, a little a small amount. Um, the hunting course over there is usually, mine was, I think, two and a half grand in euros. So that's more in dollars. Um, it was a nine month hunting course. And super involved like i mean it was basically like taking a college course you know like we had seven books that were like 100 pages thick one about mammals one about feathered wild game one was just about um wildlife management one was um about guns and weapons so all these different subjects and we would meet usually once or twice a week in the afternoon uh, sometimes like 10 hour days in the weekend and different teachers for each subject and we just all meet as a group and, and go through all the learning material it was very hands-on you'd go out into nature um, for example one time we went out with a forester and we had to learn about all the trees and plants and 
during the actual hunting exam, <laughs> there's a practical and an, a written exam part. In the practical part, for me, I actually had to identify trees. And this was in like, I think it was like February or something. So they had no leaves. So I had to identify <laughs> trees by the bark, you know. Um, but the whole system is really built to turn you into almost like a, a, like a ranger, you know, like a wildlife conservationist, um, not just someone who goes out and, and kills an animal for fun or something like that. You know, there's a lot of focus on traditions, etiquette, which we can get to if you like. Um, there's a lot of focus in like on processing. So during my course, we had to go on several drive hunts and then the animals that were harvested, we had to process and whatnot. Um, we had to learn about hunting dogs. That was cool. We had a whole field day with going out with a dog trainer and seeing the dogs work and all that. So it's very holistic. Uh, it's a pain in the butt because it's so long and it's so much money, but I'm so happy I did it, even though it was too much information and I don't remember everything I learned, you know, how it is in college too. Um, <laughs> I and, imagine uh, you retain quite a bit though. And, and you have to admit that something like that, so something that's so encompassing, uh, definitely leaves a lasting impression upon you and probably creates a better hunter, more ethical hunter and a more understanding hunter than somebody who just goes through a eight hour course or whatever it is here in the United States and, and calls it good and goes out with Joe six pack cousin and rides around on the back roads and shoots something out of somebody's field. No, I'm not saying yeah. that everybody does that, but, but having that rigorous barrier to entry does create a better hunter. Although that's, I mean, that's not what we want, right? We don't want a barrier. We want everybody to be able to enjoy it, or at least everybody that wants to. Yeah. No, I agree. It definitely does. It, I think it creates a more knowledgeable, more aware individual. Um, you know, it, the, all what really, I think what separates Germany a bit too is because of how they view hunting as like, you know, almost like a special thing, a really, really special thing. Like not many people do it. Um, there's just a lot more like etiquette and ethics and traditions and people want to follow that, you know, out here you often, you know, you, you know, that the saying, like, if it's brown, it's down, like you don't really have that in Germany. Yeah. Um, my dad would during drive hunts, he would always tell people, um, you know, if you shoot goulash, you buy goulash because in Germany, uh, you can still sell wild game meat. And if you're invited to a drive hunt, let's say my dad is, is doing a drive hunt on the land he leases, and I didn't get into the whole... Well, yeah, we'll definitely cover that. Land. Yeah. Um, he, will, he owns the animals that the people shoot. He invites a bunch of hunters. He invites a bunch of people that come as, I think they're called beaters in the U.S., like drivers. They go through his sticks and try to move the animals towards where the hunters are located. Um, and the hunters that shoot an animal and bring one down, they don't actually get the animal. They get first dibs on buying it, which is kind of interesting. Huh. It's totally different than here. Um, so he would always say, like, to the hunters before we started, like, if you shoot goulash, like, if you shoot bad you know if you just shoot it at an animal and shoot in the guts or whatnot like you're buying it like i <laughs> i can't do much with that animal anymore so um because it's you know i mean a lot of the meat quality you start set before you take the shot right so um yeah so that that's that's pretty interesting so yeah let's cover the actual opportunity as far as being able to hunt and yeah and where you could hunt then Right. So yeah, I didn't get into that. Um, so once you do, let's say I, I get my hunting license, I pass this written exam, I pass this like practical part of the exam, which includes shooting, by the way, like once a week during the course, we had to do shooting lessons. And we even had to shoot at a moving target, like a moving boar. Um, but once you have your hunting license, there's a three year period where you cannot lease any hunting land. And in Germany, like I said, you can't just go hunt on public land. You need to go to a hunter that either owns their own property and has the hunting license, meaning that they own their own property and they have the right to hunt, or a hunter that has the license and then leases land from landowners. Usually here it would be one landowner because most people have a ton of land, but over there, you know, if you have an acre, you're like, 
a big deal. So <laughs> what happens is like the the state groups different landowners because the woods are all split up into tiny like parcels of different landowners. They put them into a coalition. And then that coalition is required to either hunt on there, someone from that coalition, or they have to lease it out to a, a hunter. So my dad, for example, like leases land, and usually it's a contract of six, used to be nine years, now it's six years. So he's got to lease that land for at least six years. And I think they do that so that you can't just go in and shoot everything and leave. Because in Germany, there's no tax system either. Like the hunter who leases the land basically becomes the wildlife manager of that area, decides how many animals he's going to remove, how many, what he's going to leave and whatnot. So for you to be able to hunt, you either have to have had your hunting license for three years, allowing you to lease land legally, or you get invited to hunt. You know, the hunt, the person leasing the land gives you the, tells you written permission to go hunt on their land. And usually how that works um, is that uh, me as a young hunter, which is literally what they call you in the first three years, like a young hunter, um, I offer up my ability to work and help out on this on the land you're leasing as a hunter who can and in return i get to hunt so they built these like co-ops um it's actually kind of what doug Dern is trying to do with the sharing the land project i don't know if you've followed that at all i have not but uh it's basically to get access you offer up something to the landowner be it and or in germany the person leasing the land for hunting so you offer up you know your helping build tree stands, doing clear cuts, like conservation and land management projects, actually going out and hunting because sometimes the person leasing the land might be an old hunter and he might not have time to hunt as much. And yeah, there might not be a tax system, but the landowners get pretty pissed off if you don't hunt enough over there because there's so much in damage, right? Like it's crazy how much the wild boar are causing damage in the woods and in the fields over there. And and the farmers and landowners, there's really a lot of butting heads right now, at least in my region, between hunters and farmers and landowners, because the hunters just can't keep up with the growth of the boar population. And the amount of damage that the boar do is uh, is really going, getting out of hand a bit. So that's, Germany actually just uh, legalized the night vision scopes and whatnot nice. for that. I mean, do, do they allow uh, live trapping of them or no? <sighs> I think in some areas to do it. I definitely remember it covering that in in my uh, in in my course. But usually, trapping in Germany is really tightly regulated. It's uh, even hard. Like there's even a bigger barrier than just going out to hunt because you need your hunting license and then you need to get all those other certifications. Mm. And I whatnot. think trapping yeah. is probably like a live trap is the most effective way to get to where they don't get educated. Uh, from yeah. what I've seen, anyway, that. You can take 25 hogs in one night and not a single one because they tend to follow that sow around and that the sow is the leader of that group and she keeps, you know, birthing more piglets. Right. And uh, and she she tends to have a, a big following. And if some of those get away, they get educated and then, and then it kind of becomes fruitless to keep trying to do that. So being able to have a giant, large live trap and bait them into it and have it close once they're all in there you know, have a, a remote camera with a remote or whatever they do. Looks pretty effective. Makes a lot of sense to me. Germany is a lot like they're weird <clears throat> with all the technology and stuff. Like yeah. it took them forever to even get like the night vision scopes now legalized. And I know that that's already making a huge impact. Like when I was just back in Germany, they did say that it's been a lot more manageable with the wild boars, you know, um, because they, in Germany, it's, where I'm at, at least, you don't have these crazy giant pieces of land. Like when I'm hunting, there's almost always uh, someone walking with a dog, someone riding on horseback <laughs> that I'm seeing, you know, or someone on a bike. Like it's very tough where I'm at, at least. That's some of the get... public land spots I hunt, <laughs> actually. Yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, you just you're have to be, I think you have city. to be like 60 yards away from certain trails and things like that. Some of them, I believe, are 100, but uh, you, you have to be away from them, but you still see all these people, and they veer off the trail, and they're coming 10 yards, 20 yards from your tree stand, and it gets frustrating at times, and I tend to try to not hunt those places. Yeah, and where my dad leaves the land, it's kind of hard to avoid it, and the board just gets so educated, and 
because of this constant pressure, you, they just become so unpredictable. Like you don't know when they're going to come out. And like we've had them on cameras during all times of the day, you know? So. Yeah. So, so how is it? Is it almost all with firearm? Is there any, uh, archery equipment or how, what, what's utilized? Uh, it's all firearms. I know there's some spots now that legalized archery for boar specifically. I think I remember reading an article about some county that was doing it, but overall archery is kind of like, it's not legal for the most part. And it's kind of seen as unethical, you know, in the crowd, which obviously you can argue about that, but, um, (laughs) Yeah, we were uh, just talking about the ethics yeah. of spears a minute ago. So. <laughs> right. Overall, like when I tell, like I was taught in my hunting course that archery is like super unethical. And um, I think they have some points, you know, there there is, but you can also hunt really unethically with a firearm. So yeah, it's mostly guns and then no, there's like no semi-automatics. Um, it's all bolt action. Uh, shotguns are like double barreled. So They know. do use suppressors though, um, right? <sighs> I am not a hundred percent sure. I'd have to check on that to be honest. That's something because I never really thought about it. I'm pretty sure they do. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they do. You you'd almost think as as crowded as some of that land is that you're talking about, you'd almost need that want to it. not. Uh, yeah, or at least want it to not scare all the the homeowners and residents and and passerbyers. You know. Yeah. Yeah, if I mean it's already pretty difficult to get one in the U.S., so I assume it's even harder to do it in Germany. To be honest, so I mean in Germany, I go through this hunting license and everything, and I cannot conceal carry or anything like that. Yeah, like there's no open carry, no concealed carry. Um, the rules with like leaving guns in your vehicle, like there's no chance you can have it in your car when you're going to hunt, but the uh, um, the bolt needs to be like removed and stuff like that. Like it's super strict. Yeah. My yeah. state's like that. I don't know if you know that. I didn't um, know that. No. Yeah, my state is is very strict on those rules, and uh, it's sad to say that the only reason we have a concealed carry is because a woman actually got raped and beaten within inches of her life, and she sued the state for that right. Whoa. They had to take it to the Supreme Court, and that is the only reason we have a concealed carry in Illinois. That's wild. Yeah. They took that. Yeah. You know, they took it all the way to the Supreme court and she fought her case. And it was a valid point that if she was able to defend herself, her three attackers would have never been able to make that happen. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it's, it's a sad situation that it had to come to that, but a very thankful for that woman to have the fortitude to come forward and, and make that happen. Right. Right. No, that's definitely something I enjoy about the U S it's just, having at least the ability to protect yourself if you need it. Like granted, I never want to use it, but having the ability to, and uh, the option to, it's that freedom. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Once again, that word freedom, which I I also think has uh, been misconstrued a lot um, by people and what, what the definition of true freedom is, but it ultimately freedom is being able to protect yourself, others and uh, have the right to choose. That and also to me, a big part about freedom is not, you know, not being so self-reliant on the food system, our current food system. For me personally, like that's one of the major reasons why I hunt, fish and forage is so that I can live a more self-reliant, like self-sufficient life and uh, not have to buy all this crap, frankly, like that's in well, the grocery he, store shelves. Also the crap over here, right? I mean, versus yeah. versus in Europe and Germany where they do have some purity laws within the food and, and the, the chain, beer, the food chain, at least the beer, right? Uh, it used to be a lot of food too, though, right? To where... Yeah, but it's changing, man. Like yeah. I've seen a lot of like people go away from the more, more traditional diet cuisine to, you know, now you can get Skittles and... Uh, all these like Reese's cups and stuff where when I first like lived in Germany, that was, was not pure chocolate. Like, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I was bringing that as a gift to my friends, you know, uh, before I was enlightened with nutrition and like eating more like ancestrally aligned and whatnot. Um, but now it's, it's changing and people are eating similar, similarly crappy ultra processed stuff. Mm. Sadly. That's um, we always used to buy German sauerkraut actual german Ooh. sauerkraut versus like the franks that you get we would go to 
a German deli and uh, get our bratwurst and our and our sausages from there and the German sauerkraut because it was still like the old recipes, you know, and, and it was pure, actually pure fermented. sauerkraut where it was actually fermented and it was just salt and water and nothing else. And it, that that meant something to me. And it's sad to see that go now that, it, it, you know, it probably won't be imported so pure anymore. <laughs> well, I think actually there's a, a push, like we were just talking a bit before about like COVID and whatnot. And I think there's a push to more traditional foods again. People are waking up to the fact that 58% of what the average American eats a day is ultra processed, uh, in a year is ultra processed food. And oils. And, <laughs> and, and seed oils, exactly. Like just... Stuff that if you showed it to your ancestors and how it's made, they'd be like, what are you putting in your body? You know, yeah. Um, stuff that's totally devoid of nutrition um, might have your like fats and carbs, but it's just absolutely lacking the micronutrients your body needs to thrive. And uh, the wild foods is a great way of bringing some of that back into your diet. And if you're willing to pay with your time instead of, you know, more so than your money, I think it's a. It can be very lucrative. Yeah, um, getting into the wild food side of things and wild food procurement. So, speaking of wild foods and stuff, how how did that journey start for you? Then, I mean, did it start in Germany? I know you said a little bit with wild edibles, yeah. but, but was it something that was uh, stayed with you the whole time, or no? So I, you know, I came to the whole food thing um, through bodybuilding and nutrition actually like hobby bodybuilding when i moved back to germany after high, after spending high school in, in wisconsin um i was all about like training and eating super clean um you know really realizing that what i put in my body is fuel for my body like that's what's gonna make me feel good it's gonna give me clarity of mind and just be able to perform really well then I started all the hunting and fishing with my stepbrother, and he was actually doing a uh, apprenticeship to becoming a organic farmer. So we had all these conversations, like me from the nutrition side of everything I knew, and him from the like farming side and food procurement side. And we just came to this realization that the food system is just effed up, and <laughs> that most of what we eat is just not good for us. And then we like had this aha moment, like, whoa, we're hunting and fishing, like we have like access to all this now and more so than most people and it's probably super like it is super nutritious you know like i mean if you're looking at an elk or whatnot you're eating like an athlete right you're eating this yeah. animal that's out there every day exposed to the to nature to the environment it, a, a healthy plant and farming often like one that has more nutrition is the one that was able to really you know, that wasn't pampered like a piece of corn that was just sprayed or given was... a bunch of fertilizers. It's the one that was able to work with the with the environment. And it was and the soil. one that was able to grow within the cracks of the sidewalk, even though someone sprayed. That's yeah. the healthy one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that. That's the powerful one. And uh, yeah, so from there on, uh, like hunting and fishing kind of started it. And then this, like, I remembered foraging with my mom and I was just like wanting to get more into the plant side of things. And I thought it was so cool because like no one around me knew anything about it. So I wanted to learn a bunch about foraging. And and uh, then when I came back to U the U.S., I connected with some friends in college who were really uh, studying mycology and botany. And we really got into it. And we spent most of our time, especially during COVID, like out there uh, foraging, hunting, fishing. And uh, yeah, I mean... I always say, you know, on my so I, I do a podcast too, Year of Plenty, which is yeah, we didn't get into that yet, but... <laughs> yeah, like traditional food ways, wild foods, homesteading, and whatnot. Those are all nutrition. Those are all topics I cover. But on a podcast, I always say, once you get into this wild food thing, you'll literally never be bored again because no. there's so many rabbit holes. Like it's a lifelong yeah, learning it's process, a journey. You know, it's such a journey, and that's actually. The big thing that I think people should focus on is not just the kill and getting the food, although that's definitely the most important for me is getting the food. But if you focus on the process, the journey, um, the nature connection, you can just come home with a much more enriched life, I think. 
Even Absolutely. if you don't, if you, there, if you never kill anything, you know. No, and that's the beauty of of the all encompassing lifestyle to where you do forage. And I talk about it all the time, but I can't help it, right? Even though you're out hunting and say you don't get something, having that foraging background, learning those other plants and all those other things around you, you're constantly surrounded by food. It's never a failure. It's a success of some sort. And in one week you might be out there and kill a deer and you want to go out and kill a deer the next week as well, but you don't kill a deer, but you end up finding something that wasn't in season even a week ago. And now it is. Uh, Yeah. I love, I love early October when I'm deer hunting, nobody else is out in the woods for some reason because it's football season and they're still wrapped up in that. And my weekends are wide open and I don't watch the sports. I could care less about what's going on with those sports because there's so much out there in the real Same. world. I am not, I'd rather be an active participant than an armchair quarterback. And, 100%. and by doing that and getting out there and doing those things, I have free range to the woods. And also now I have access to all those wonderful hen of the woods mushrooms. And, and yeah. there's been times where I filled up game bags and a I backpack missed those so much. full of them. <laughs> <laughs> I miss yeah no that's like Hannah the Woods great example of if you get onto the right like amount at the right time you can walk away with 13 15 pounds you know you can freeze it yeah you can um I mean you can feed yourself and others for a while just with one find and I I I miss Hannah the Woods so much I don't have any <laughs> oak oak trees out here in Montana and that's like one of my absolute favorites they, I mean you do have the king bolites right so that's a pretty good right. trade-off though yeah also kind of a new one for me like last year was really the first one uh first time me and my buddy Hayden really got into it and um well sorry not last year but the year before because last year the crop was for some reason it was just horrible like we barely found any and uh, those are, I mean, yeah, they taste super good. There's, it's obvious, it's it's one of the most prized mushrooms in the culinary world for a reason, the porcini. So yeah. Um, but what I was gonna say with what you were just saying, like being able to find, you know, you're going out hunting and then you find, let's say, a mushroom that's in season, like that's such a big benefit of getting into hunting, fishing, and foraging at the same time, and really making it, you know, a, a holistic thing like that because you start to become a lot more aware as a participant because now you're hunting, but you're not just like focused on the deer. You're also looking at the trees and <laughs> looking at the ground and like, Oh, what is I get distracted so much when I'm out <laughs> deer hunting, you know, by other stuff, or if I'm just going on a hike and then this like connectedness that you built, um, you know, between the, the different activities, that is great. Like I'm, I'm trout fishing. And uh, in Wisconsin, let's say Coon Valley, like I, li- I lived in La Crosse. That's where I went to college. It's a driftless region. So for the Midwest, driftless it's one of the best. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. One of the best tr- trout fishing and foraging is insane there, hunting too. Um, but like I'd be trout fishing in a stream, you know, on a beautiful morning. And I look down and I see a bunch of plants in the in the water. Well, I have this foraging knowledge. I know it's watercress. So now I'm harvesting a bunch of watercress. And also hopefully taking uh, back a trout and then cooking that together. You Smoke know? it and make a Smoke, nice little yeah. salad, right? Ooh, so or, like, <laughs> or I could see like smoked, make like a cream cheese and tr- smoke trout dip. And then, yeah, have that with a piece of sourdough bread and a watercress salad or something. Yeah, that, that sounds, <laughs> see, it's amazing. That and it's never ending. <laughs> and the more you yeah. learn, the more you want to do with so many things. It, it's right. wonderful. And to know where it came from for the most part, what has been done to it or not done to it. It's so empowering. Like yeah. you are really the one that's in full control, like more so even than you get, if you get something from a local farmer, you know, you're the one that was responsible for killing that deer, catching that fish, digging up that root. And you're seeing it from that point all the way till until it lands on your plate and in your stomach. And, you know, if something goes wrong, it's your fault. So there's a lot of responsibility there too. And um, yeah, the connectedness in that way, it just, it just, I don't know, it feels really good. And it, there's something primal about it. Like it's like, it almost triggers like, at least in me, this like instinct that just feels so right. It feels like this is what I'm meant to do. It does. It absolutely does. I think, I think it triggers something that, that you're connected to, that you were lacking, that, that you haven't, 
uh, experience before, and and all of a sudden, it's like, it's like you're touching this fabric that's somehow connected to you that you never even knew it, and it's and it's putting you connecting you to another place, and and it takes you away from that synthetic environment that's been created all around you, and it's yeah. so terrible. Like I'm I'm going for a knee surgery here pretty soon, um, and when I'm outside and I'm in the grass for some reason that pain it goes away and and it, yes it could be the magnetic field from the earth and and my body's grounding the grounding to it, yeah. but it's also soft and it's natural and the way it's supposed to be and then you put those shoes on and you get on concrete that you're not supposed to be on and you're on it all day it kills yeah. it kills at the end of the day and it's it one it's... of those things that it's not supposed to be there but we're there all the time right and so many people <laughs> only experience that yes you know they live in big cities and um yeah it's they never get to go on any public land or they don't even know that it really exists which is kind of sad to think about but yeah i mean it could be have you ever heard of nature bathing that's kind of yeah. like one of the benefits yeah I, and all I, the, I get <laughs> yeah what the what the japanese did in the studies with the people with heart problems and yeah yeah like i mean there were even studies that i read about where they put someone in a treadmill indoors had them running indoors versus out in the woods and the person out in the woods just their immune system had a much much better reaction like was boosted or uh, compared to the person running indoors so i there's definitely something we don't really fully understand about being out in our like truly our natural environment you know as human species and uh, i think wild foods at least and, and going after them is one way to tap into that that like ancestral living i guess uh, that honestly like this really basic or essential experience of human life right like this yeah. is what we did for thousands <laughs> tens of thousands of years of being humans is like not being in a in a house like this that i'm in right now with the heat on all winter like we were out there experiencing nature to the fullest and uh on average, it takes about 30 days for a person to break their New Year's resolution. So if saving money was on your 2024 list, your odds aren't really looking that great. Luckily, I have a 100% guaranteed way to save you money this year. Just switch to Mint Mobile right now. Mint Mobile has wireless plans starting at just $15 a month. That's unlimited talk, text, and data for $15 a month. If you save as much as I think you're going to, you are going to be able to afford a brand new rod and reel. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all of your existing contacts. To get your new wireless plan for 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash waypoint. That's mintmobile.com slash waypoint. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash waypoint. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Pursuing wild game in wild places. Tune in to Hunt Stand Presents Saturdays at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. Waypoint TV, the destination for outdoor entertainment. Yeah, if you start getting back into that, I think you're not only going to find better health, especially with the exercise that comes along with it, the nutrition, but you're just also going to like just feel a lot better mentally, you know? Yeah, I always tell my buddies if uh, the apocalypse comes, I'm going to be just a roaming uh, tribe and anybody can join my tribe and we're just going to be nomads and we're yeah. just going to, you know, flow like the butter, if you will, uh, to stay in that perfect state where we don't get too hard and we don't get too soft. It's just, you stay the right medium and you, and you flow the course and just follow the right. food. <laughs> yeah. Man. Yeah. I, I, rem I like think about that stuff sometimes too. Um, <clears throat> would be interesting. I mean, that's another benefit of go hunting and fishing and foraging. Um, and I say this kind of a little bit tongue in cheek, but you will be on people's like, if the shit hits the fan, I'm calling you list. Yeah. Right? And like, I tell them I'm not going to be there. <laughs> you can join yeah. my tribe, but, yeah. but I'm not going to be there. <laughs> right. Yeah. But I get that all the time. Like, oh, you know how to forage? Like, I'm calling you if stuff yeah. goes bad. Yeah. You know, I'm like, oh, I don't know if I'll be able to find enough for all of you, but you can try. You can try. <laughs> No, that's uh, what I find interesting is my kids and how fast they pick it up. Hmm. Like they're they're not so far disconnected from their instincts yet. 
and and my my middle kid she just really gravitates to it and she's always picking things up and touching it and looking at it and and asking what's this one uh is it edible because it looks very similar and she'll pick up on things now and she's like this one looks very similar to this and in fact we just found i think it was like yellow rocket or something like that um in the in the in the mustard family and and uh and I'm like, it looks like a brassica, but I don't know. You it's, know, uh, win- winter crest is another name for yes, it. Yes, winter crest, yeah. yellow rocket. Yep. So, uh, just found that in the yard the other day, and my wife and I were talking. And it's funny because we haven't sprayed our yard, and and you know the previous people did, and I th- actually I think I did once when we first moved here, but that was over like ten years ago now. And so, it's funny to see all the things that are coming back, and we don't put fertilizer or grass seed or anything and just let the natural stuff come back and so now you're seeing the winter crest or the yellow rocket and all these other things just popping up all over the place and and uh last year was the first year that i saw cardinal flower and uh oh, wow. yeah so cardinal lobelia cardinalis right i think that's and and saw that in my yard for the first time ever and i was like oh that's amazing well or, that's the thing yeah yeah it, it's just well, the thing is like a lot of the what we consider to be weeds uh, are really edible plants yeah, like yeah they're like like dandelion um the wind like the yellow rocket <laughs> amaranth like lamb's quarters oh, i love lamb's quarter <laughs> same like that's what so many favorite. of these all right and so many of these plants are like burdock that's one i'm i'm really trying to get good at burdock this year and that's considered a um a huge like weed and people want to remove it out of their out of their land yeah i mean it has some downsides it's basically the plant that grows these giant rhubarb like leaves and has a giant stalk that's like six foot tall and has, grows nasty burrs that you can never get off anything but it's a it's actually a domesticated vegetable like yeah. in asia they still plant it for like in, in japan and whatnot it's huge in their cuisine to use burdock isn't that uh, a roots. different species of burdock though like uh i don't know i don't know yeah. about that because there's I, I think i think their burdock gets bigger and it's a little bit more tender um, i know there's a now that could common... be the growing method but yeah i know um, and that is a thing though like you know if you grow something in more softer soil often it has better eating qualities than something grown in the wild sometimes um but I think there's like a great burdock from what I was been studying and then a common burdock. And okay. maybe they have the great burdock over there. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited to, most people go after the roots. But I was just uh, learning that the stalks when peeled are not fibrous at all. The young stalks, they're like starchy and uh, are great in like soups and stews. You can use them like a potato or turnip and whatnot. So, oh, that's awesome. That's, that's <laughs> now I'm going to do that. <laughs> Yeah, I'm definitely going like, to do that this year. One of the one of the main plants I'm looking for, and I have found now over the years that I don't really try to focus on a bunch of new plants or mushrooms every year because uh, you just get overwhelmed and you can't learn that species deeply enough and then get good enough at identifying it with confidence to be able to take it home for food unless you have like a mentor or something which is huge too by the way so for me um what i always like to do around this time of the year is like i'll make a foraging list in the winter of my staples that i have spots for already that i know i can easily get because i've marked the spots i've been there i've harvested them i can look at pictures and the dates and timing to get a good idea of when they might when it might come time to harvest them um, and then a list like a section a list of like my primary like my priority plants and mushrooms these are like the ones that i definitely want to have end up in my skillet that year yeah. if i can and those will usually be like one or two per like spring summer fall and uh, then also though like a couple what i call like secondary plants or mushrooms that are I think they're cool. They'd be cool to find, but I'm not going to put so much time into researching them more. So maybe I'll just look at a couple pictures because um, what I, what's often happened is I'll look for like one species and then I run into this other species that I was just kind of, you know, reading into a little bit. Um, so I think it's always good to have like your main ones you definitely want to find, but then also do a little research into some other ones. Uh, so you might be able to 
to find dough is pretty easily on your walk trying to find you the primary like your priority ones is it that is a thing right like have you noticed how a lot of especially in wisconsin i feel like it was this way a lot a lot of the edibles were kind of grown in similar similar areas usually like around bodies of water is what i was yeah. kind of finding and, and that makes sense because like all of our ancestors would settle around bodies of water because things there's just more life there right yeah in fact my neighbor was telling me he's like your property uh was typically like a native campsite an indigenous campsite back in the day Whoa, and i was like really? that's cool and and he goes yeah when we were kids because he's grown up in the area he said uh that they used to find a lot of arrowheads after storms, heavy storms, right on one of the little uh, knobs on my property. And I was like, really? That's so interesting. And I've gone out looking a bunch of times, and I haven't found anything. Oh, man. After floods where the road's away the bank. I've looked a lot, but I've never found anything. And it'd be pretty cool to find something. But he said, uh, and, and, and after he said that, I started thinking about it. I'm like, well, it makes sense as a body of water. It's kind of Mm -hmm. on a main corridor that they used to travel. There was actually like a, a trade route that was, uh, they actually named it. I can't remember what the name was, but it was like a heavily traveled trade route. And so they'd be along that on all the way from back, you know, hunting grounds and stuff. So <laughs> kind of neat to see that and, and hear about it and like know it exists. And now it makes sense to me why, though, you know, because it was a knob. It was higher up. They, you know, they weren't directly on the water, but it was right be- below them and stuff. So, yeah, no, it's it, I, that's one of my favorite things about all of this is not just like modern day foraging, but then also learning about the anthropology and the archaeology around how our ancestors did everything right like it just it was such a different life they didn't have the tools we have today and they still got it done right absolutely in like, fact some of their tools might have been better and we don't realize it but yeah, <laughs> their methods then, right yeah. we're sitting here with a hammer on our garage floor cracking uh, black walnuts and acorns and yeah. and <laughs> they probably had some big stone something that they used and and then poured them and put them in pits and poured water on top of them and leached them and we're trying to do it with five gallon buckets and uh and or like some people use their toilet tank or something and oh my and, god <laughs> and it's totally not the right way to do it and and uh they had the method dialed in and we're doing it all backwards but now. all that knowledge got lost yeah right? absolutely but especially like i think I think we knew a lot up to like 150 years ago when like all this industrial food was happening. I think before then people knew a lot more than we do do now. And it just like, it does not take long. It really just takes like a generation or two for some of that knowledge to get lost um, because no one wants to do it anymore because it's quote unquote hard, right? And like difficult. Um, yeah. And I, I, I don't... I've been trying to pursue that more and more lately and uh, really, really just try and learn those lost ways, especially food preservation, uh, all those things. Because it just intrigues me, number one, that, that I can take a piece of meat, salt it, do diff- whatever to it, and come back six months later and cut a chunk off of it. You what, know, were you, what were you doing there? I'm I haven't done it yet. I'm, I'm okay, researching, okay. but yes. Yeah. Um, but, but things like that. And so before my grandmother passed, I actually went down to Texas and sat down with her and interviewed her and asked her about all those things. And she even had lost so many of those things. She grew up as a kid doing them, but didn't remember them and remembered in her mind, she hated them. And one of the things she told me is she hated having to do that. And she didn't want to marry a farmer. That was her thing. She did not want to marry a farmer. And so she married my grandfather and, and they lived their lifestyle the way they lived and, you know, moved around military base to military base. But, um, they, she did not want to marry a farmer. She did not want that life. And she said it was too hard. When was that? Like the fifties? No, that was, that would have been uh like great depression. You know, she grew up. Okay. Yeah. So well, it's, but it's, af- after that is kind of when like the big act thing happened and like, you know, that, that famous quote, like get bigger, go home or whatever it was, where they basically just yeah. centralized our food system more and like farming became something that was frowned upon. And, you know, you had to be educated to be something. And now at this point, we're at, we're at the point where like, we don't even know where our food's coming from. We don't know the people who are pro- working hard every day to produce it. And they're definitely not getting paid. Like, 
it's basically like the corporations controlling it are, are getting paid, but not the people producing our food. So. Yeah, she was born in the, I think, either early 20s or before then. And uh, so it was interesting to hear everything and how, I mean, they would even save the corn cobs. It was something to where everything was utilized. And so when they would shell corn, the corn would go in the bin and the other one would go in the cob bin or the cob house that they had. And then when they ran out of coal in the winter, they were using the corn cobs for heat. Wow. So, I mean, everything was utilized. That's wild. Yeah. Well, but staying on that topic of utilization, though, that's another thing of like, if you're hunting, foraging, you learn how to butcher yourself, right? It's yep. wild how well you can utilize that animal. Um you can, I mean, you can use the bones, you can use the tongue, you could use the eyes if you wanted to, you could use the hide for something. That's something I, I really would love to get in, into. I saw a guy on Instagram wearing a buckskin sweatshirt. Oh, that's so, cool. Yeah. So cool. And I'm like, man, that would be cool to have. Um, or like even a belt or something, you know, something much simpler to make. But you can use that animal in so many ways. And I think you kind of owe it to that animal after taking its life did you try to at least make an effort to utilize as much as you can be it organ meats which by the way are like super nutritional uh super nutritious micronutrient dense um or be it like the bones to make bone broth so many people i know just they don't never take the rib meat the neck meat off their deers and i would actually tell my friends in college like call me i will get it before you throw it out i don't take um, the rib meat off my deer i do take the neck meat why not? Is are you like worried about like are you not a fan of the fat or what? There's what just not. Your I mean, there's really not that much at all on yeah. it, and and I you, use a lot of times. I use it to bake coyotes at that point. Yeah, that's not. I mean, that's at least using yeah. it. But yeah, I, I utilize I've it been, and the birds. I like feeding the birds and watching the birds peck at it too. <laughs> right, like you're at least giving it back. Yeah. Um, but you'd be surprised if you learn how to take off like a whole rib roast. Um, take off the entire ribs instead of boning them out, um, which I just started doing with my friend on, on deer in Wisconsin. And then what you ha can do is you have a big flat piece of meat, right? You can roll it up and braise it that way. Uh, it's kind of like in Germany, we do ro roulades. Roulades, which yes. Are yeah, which are <laughs> like a, um, a thinly cut piece of meat, pound it to tenderize it. And then where I'm from in Germany, we do mustard, um, bacon and pickles. pickles yeah and you roll that onion. thing up <laughs> and onion yeah and you roll that thing up and you braise it in like a brown you know you braise it and then make a brown sauce with it and some red cabbage on the side you do that with a rib roast it's so good and it's i mean i love fat I, i'm i've been eating a low carb diet forever like high fat high high um protein that's not a traditional german food diet necessarily with the, like the no carb well i mean yeah no. most of their their meats are paired with some heavy carbs <laughs> it, yeah it is true and that that's also came that was actually i forgot to mention that earlier uh during the whole time when i was learning to hunt and fish and becoming much more aware of my food i read this book called the primal blueprint which changed the way i think about food it's written by marxists and it's all about like ancestral health eating like this paleo primal diet, you know, cutting out a lot of the refined sugars, a lot of those unnatural sugar sources, then grains. So if you think about it, we've really only been eating grains for probably 10,000 years, but humans have been around for like several million years. But we started eating grains when we developed agriculture, which was about eight to 10,000 years ago. So it's kind of new to our diet in the grand scheme of things. So that's probably why a lot of people don't deal with it super well no you know? yeah so i'm one of I mean, those I, <laughs> so, yeah so. And I, I i cut those out it's super hard because they're like in everything <clears throat> but um you know it it was definitely a big game changer for my digestion i would say like for my, so are my you health. i mean completely grain free or are you uh, doing no, like ancient I'm, type grains I, and, and i was like there was a part where i was there was a time i did that I for almost like, a year yeah i, I was doing like hardcore low carb for like a like keto for like three. And then I went into like 80 to hundred grams of carbs for, and then still mostly no grains. I mean, it, I've been doing it for like nine years. And then last year I started to include um, honey and fruit again, and now a little bit more like rice again. And uh, in my girlfriend loves to bake sourdough. So like a fermented grain, I think is fine. 
um, because that's actually, if you look at traditional diets, like that's how people consume the grains. They process them somewhere, some way, usually fermenting, soaking the grains, which a lot of these grains have anti-nutrients in them, one of them being uh, phytic acid. And that's one that, one, it causes gut issues, but it also binds to really essential minerals and nutrients. So if you eat the grains un soaked or unfermented with other food you might not be able to absorb all the nutrients you're getting from that other food but soaking and fermenting it actually deactivates that phytic acid and uh you know unlocks a lot more nutrition and it's interesting how our ancestors knew that but we have totally forgotten it right so you don't miss um, eating sparrows the spots will uh, Spätzle, spätzle. I, I, do, I mean, I do. And like, I'm never a hundred percent in all this. Like if, it's, like if it's Christmas or something, you know, I will eat it. Um, and I'm also make I draw a fine line between like store-bought and like homemade. Oh yeah. It's gotta be homemade you know? with some yeah, homemade gravy be. right out of the, the cast iron skillet too. Yeah, but yeah. I can't eat those anymore. I don't, yeah. uh, but my grandmother <laughs> used to make them. You know, it was, it was like browned butter and whatever meat juices or whatever it was. Oh. And oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's all, <laughs> it's it all great. And I, I do agree. Like there are some ancient grain varieties that seem to really do better with a lot of people. Like I, uh, einkorn is one that's, I think even the oldest grain I tried we it. have. I couldn't do it. Didn't do <laughs> no, it. No, no. Really? Unfortunately. Have you, yeah. have you tried sourdough stuff like real sourdough? <sighs> it's been so long, but yes, I, I have. I feel like they still affect me. Um, yeah. At this point, I just, I can't do gluten anymore. Yeah. It, I think yeah, it's gotten to the point to where it's so bad. And I had, so recently I, I don't actually drink. So I found some non-alcohol gluten removed beers. And I thought to myself, oh, this is cool. Now I can kind of just enjoy that taste that I do love and, right. uh, and, and enjoy a couple of them. So I had one just to test the waters and everything was fine. And I was like, oh, this is great. You know, I'm standing on a dock on a, you know, on a lake. It's nice to have a beer, drink it, watch the sunset. Next day I have two. No problem. About a week later, I order a six pack, comes in Amazon <laughs> And I'm out in the yard and it's uh, just drinking them, you know, one here and there. And I consume the whole six pack. Well, later that night, I, I forgot all about the fact that I drank six of them. I had gastro, gastrointestinal issues, but we also ate out that night. So I thought maybe it was something that I ate while we were out. Um, and then the next day I wake up, my joints are stiff. They're mm. sore. Um and I had these like blisters on my face and I'm like, what? And I, I didn't put two and two together at first. And I was talking to my wife and she goes, might've been them beers you drank. And I was like, oh, it was. So gluten removed is not gluten taken out. <laughs> it's, it's probably like decaf or, and you know, yeah. no alcohol. There's yeah. still a little left. It was enough to and mess like, me up pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, what's probably happening is like your immune system's overreacting to the little gluten particles that are going into your bloodstream and whatnot because your, your gut, you know, uh, has issues with it and lets it through. So, yeah. um, yeah, I mean, I think that is one of the major reasons why people have so many, I mean, it's so common for people to have a bunch of gut issues these days. And I think it, a lot of it is attributed to, um, the modern grain that we're eating and the way we're processing it and spraying on it and right. everything else and i think those chemicals tend to also i mean it sticks on it we know it's on it they've tested cheerios and found that they're one of the yeah. highest glyphosate of anything the stuff for feeding kids like, right. right and the fact that now your body's getting those irritants and it, it it's making that association with the gluten as well, which is causing it to your body to have that inflammatory response even more when it when it does get the gluten. So right. kind of crazy. And when you cut it out long enough, like the carbs, the refined stuff, and especially the grain, like you don't crave it anymore. It's got to be long enough. It can't be just like a month or two. Yeah. If you really cut it out for like several years, I mean, I rarely am I all... I do love pastries. Like, don't get me wrong. That's like my one vice, but I rarely have a craving for them. And uh, if I do, I want like something well-made. And uh, yeah, if you just really cut it out long enough, you just kind of don't want it. And what I use, I mean, I I love cooking like extravagant recipes and whatnot. And, but I usually day to day, I eat so simple. I eat literally mostly meat, like 
a pound, usually two pounds of meat is what I eat a day. Then I, and then I'll make like a pound per meal, two meals, and I'll cook ground meat, which I used to kind of be against turning my wild game into ground meat, but not anymore. It's for so simple. Yeah. <laughs> so, so so it's so versatile and simple. Yeah. But I basically just cook my ground meat, either in burger form or like taco meat form, season it however I want in a skillet. And then I'll cook, you know, I'll do oven roasted veggies, whatever I feel like on that day. And uh, maybe an egg and an avocado. And I'll like just have like a, a, a meat and veggie scramble, like a skillet basically. Yeah. And that's what I eat every day. It never gets boring to me. And I'm getting like top nutrition and enough calories. And I'm eating actually less than what the average american eats uh eats for per day so i just looked this up recently it's it's and, insane the amount that we eat well yeah and the amount we spend on a, an average american spends i think 22 or 23 dollars a day on food 12 around 12 of that goes for food you eat at home and the rest for eating out well i can buy a pound of meat for like four bucks or if i hunt i mean i have a shit ton of I can, can yeah, I say shit. Have, yeah. a, have, a, have a ton of uh, have a ton of ground meat in the freezer right now, because we also just butchered some lambs recently, and uh, you know, like it, it's just I probably one of those meals costs me between eight to ten bucks, and I'm eating way healthier than most people. You know, did you keep so, the brains? No, I did not keep. The, I've never done that. Me neither. I've never done that. I, I, but I, I'm always curious when people do that and, and utilize it. Like I, I am not a fan of head cheese, so I don't know. Uh, yeah, how it would be. Yeah. I, that's something I've, especially with like, I don't know how you feel about CWD and all. Um, but like, that's something I've kind of avoided a bit. I, I would try it from like, a like, some, like a cow for sure, you know, sheep or something. Um, I probably should one day just try it from a wild game but i've i'm talking I've from take... the lambs that you butchered oh from the lambs yeah, okay yeah no we did not take not the brain, not the but... brain i don't i'm afraid to I, i'm afraid to even consume the organs of most of my deer i get i get all of them tested because really CWD, tell me about that yeah i oh, get them all tested tested for cwd yes. specifically yeah okay because i have lately been doing a bit more research and i guess a lot of like deer in heavy agricultural areas where there's a lot of monocrops and pesticides mm -hmm. and especially close to cities their organs some of them tend to have higher levels of pesticides and whatnot yeah. so it's something i hate to say but even in the wild game you know it it's getting in there but that always makes me think like if it's in those levels in the wild game how much how high are the levels in the farm raised animals you the know, ones that, that they're are, feeding well i mean they're, they're obviously it. feeding the grain uh, the deer are definitely eating the grain. And if anybody says it's 100% organic, natural, whatever, and you mm -hmm. hunt in the Midwest, that is absolutely not the case. Nor not is it anymore. the case with any fowl that you hunt. Yeah. Especially yeah. because they're going all the way through the grain belt, eating their way the entire way right. and, and making it to wherever they are that you shoot it. I still think there's a difference though in terms of like them being exposed to the natural elements, just having an overall oh, yeah. health, healthier <laughs> yeah. life. And I think, and they're also not injected with a bunch of hormones and antibiotics right. and, and, uh, vaccinations and different things. That... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, va they're putting the, the MRNA vaccine now in cows and whatnot. So, yeah. Yeah. That's a interesting topic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. Well, we'll see how that like gets people riled up once it actually like becomes more common knowledge. But yeah, you know. yeah. There's there's a lot to that, and that's all goes back to pretty much what we've talked about the entire time, and that's uh, getting your own food though. Hundred um, percent. Sure. But Poldy, yeah. it's been awesome. I think we could ramble on for a long time. It seems that we yeah. definitely have uh, the same ideas when we talk about things, and it's always interesting to to hear somebody else talk about them. But uh, before we go, can you kind of tell me where everybody can find you, listen to your podcast, uh, reach out to you if they want to, and follow you on uh, socials? Absolutely. Yeah, first of all, I really appreciate you having me on. This has been super fun. I agree we could definitely <laughs> ramble on a lot more. Um, but I think some of the stuff we just covered uh, will hopefully bring a lot of value to your listeners. Um, yeah, if you want to find me, 
I mean, the number one thing I do, my biggest like passion project is also a podcast. Like I mentioned earlier, Year of Plenty is what it's called. You can find that on any podcast platform out there. Um, cover topics around like, a, like wild food, traditional food waste, nutrition, homesteading, getting more into the food preservation side of things too, like canning and fermenting and whatnot. Um, and you can find that on www.theyearofplenty.com. Otherwise, Instagram is the one platform I'm most active on. I'm just at Poldy Wieland on there, P-O-L-D-I-W-I-E-L-A-N-D. And then uh, if you wanted to, like Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, they're all uh, podcast-specific pages there just for Year of Plenty if you want to find it. But yeah, podcast is where I pump out the most content. And then I'm really trying to get my blog going just because I found the value in writing and I've start i'm starting to enjoy it more me too Um, that's something i never thought i would do in fact when i first started the podcast i reached out to a guy named tony peterson and you may Mm -hmm. have heard of him as a writer and Uh uh and he does some stuff with meat eater too but anyway i reached out to him and he was actually nice enough to talk to me about podcasting and at at the time his podcast was one of my favorite ones to listen to so i reached out to him oh that's awesome he was super helpful and and he goes, it's kind of refreshing to have somebody reach out to me and not ask me about writing. And I said, yeah, that's something I don't think I'll ever want to do. And here I am two and a half, almost three years later into it. And lo and behold, I find myself sitting down and just pouring words on, <laughs> onto yeah. the screen of my laptop. And next thing you know, I'm a thousand words deep. And I never thought yeah. that that would be me, but now I almost want to call him back and say, "Hey, do you uh, do you think maybe you could give me some pointers on that too?" Yeah, <laughs> man, it's so the writing part. It's it's so hard to sit down and start doing it. And I'm kind of like sometimes a perfectionist, but I've just kind of let go of like the it needs to be a perfect format. Like need, everything needs to be perfect. I'm just writing out. I thoughts. think that's the German in us that, that yeah, does that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm the same way. And my wife gets so mad at me, and she tells me the same as what you just said. You need to put it down. You can always edit it later. You can always change it. Right. And I'm always looking for the right words to emphasize properly. And I hyper fixate on that to the point to where it'll take me 10 minutes to write one sentence before I get to the next one. And I, right. I'm just starting to overcome that too. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that'll, that'll be good. Um, I'm hoping to just do a bunch of bunch of blogs. And it's just so good to hash out your own ideas like that and opinions and just uh, become, I mean, if you look at it, all the greats, had a journal or were writing Teddy Roosevelt, you know, like all these people that uh, we remember in history and that really had a big impact um, with their ideas. They were all writing um, journals basically. So yeah. I, there's gotta be some value into in it. If, if all these people were doing it, you were definitely more organized as me as far as your foraging journals and things like that. I do not <laughs> do that. And it's such a great idea. It's, and and Clay Bowers does that all the time, and he can tell me, oh yeah, this is kind of weird because the past four years it's always been this date, and now it's it they're, they're, it's in season right now, and for just about everything out there. And I'm the uh-huh. kind of guy where I'm like, ah, the weather kind of feels like uh, might be might be time to start looking, you know. And I'm just not, I don't. My wife gets mad at me, I for time keeping track of time. Uh, calendar. I could care less what day it is on that calendar. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me. It's never mattered. It, it's I just the freedom. I, I go by you feel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, nobody else likes that. Though. <laughs> I I don't. I gotta say, I try to do a journal, but I'm not as consistent with it as I would like to be. Like, I I really want to try to make it a a real like consistent thing starting this year. Um, because I have friends that hunt and fish. I have one friend. He's like my fishing mentor knows everything about fishing salmon on Lake Michigan and walleye. And he's, since he's like 15, he's kept a fishing journal and he, the knowledge he has now and using that to make decisions for the following season is just invaluable for him. So wow. that is, yeah, um, I need to, I need to do well, that. With, the good thing with foraging is here's a hot tip. I mean, I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, is taking pic- a ton of pictures and then yeah. organizing that maybe if you can into folders because you can always go back, look at um, the date and time 
hopefully you have your location turned off, you know, in yeah, case you send right? it to someone else. Yeah. Like I would like to have the location on there, but I got Onyx for that to, to mark my spots, which is another big tip in foraging, I think, is mark, mark, mark everything. Yeah. Because uh, you can analyze it before the season. Also see date and time again and really go back to those spots because most plants and mushrooms are going to keep popping in that same area year after year. So, You know what's weird is I, I feel – I feel my way through the woods now. Like I, it's like, I, I, you know how we talked about that connection. It's just yeah. one. I, I try and feel my way through with that connection and I'll stop and I'll examine a log and be like, I remember this log from however long. That's weird that that's here. I thought it was further over. Maybe it flooded. And then, you know, you just kind of, that's the way my mind, my, my mind is a very messed up mind. I think and if people had the, to see the inner workings of it and how and how it actually works because i'll get so sidetracked i'll end up a mile from where my destination was because i felt my way through the woods and ended up touching a couple plants and it piqued my curiosity to see whatever was there (laughs) it just means you're like a really good observer and a really curious person which is both are both are not bad things you know (laughs) Yeah, I think ADD tends to work in your benefit when you're in nature, and that's about the only place. But <laughs> yeah, ooh, elk, ooh, and then yeah. you're yeah. looking at something on the ground. Yeah, I always pull out my binoculars too, and I'll be up in the tree stand, and like people, if they saw me, they would think I was actually looking for deer. I could care less because if the deer is not within range, unless I'm calling it in or whatever, it doesn't matter. I'm looking for mushrooms and different plants that I can pick when I get down. <laughs> All right, all right. That, that's the beauty of it yeah. all. So, awesome, man. I to- totally appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much. And uh, it for was sure. it was amazing to talk to you. We'll have to have you back on. Yeah, I'd love to, and I'd love to have you on the Year of Plenty as well sometime. Absolutely, so we should totally get that going. Awesome. Thanks, man. Yep. Once again, thank you so much for listening to the Publicly Challenged podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show, and if you did, please subscribe on whatever platform it is you're listening to. Also, if you could leave a review, that would help us out. And you can check us out on Instagram or at publiclychallenged.com. And once again, thank you so much for listening to the show. want to succeed you want to fish you want to be one of the greatest tune in to west marines life on the water presented by costa custom boats every saturday night from 7 to 9 p.m eastern on waypoint tv